In Paleolithic caves of France and Spain, painted animals and signs fascinate visitors and intrigue researchers from all over the world. Color, particularly red ochre, plays a prominent role in most human cultures. But when were pigments used for the first time? Did our ancestors use them for symbolic purposes? The earliest secure evidence of pigment use is found at 300,000-year-old archaeological sites in Africa and Europe. They consist of iron-rich rocks modified by grinding, scraping, rubbing, and napping to produce red powder or fragments which were used as crayons. Ochre fragments were also engraved with abstract patterns at 70,000-year-old Middle Stone Age sites from southern Africa. In spite of its key role for the emergence of our species, ancient evidence for pigment use is only beginning to be uncovered in East Africa. A remarkable example of ochre exploitation in this region comes from Porcapic Cave, an archaeological site located a few kilometers from the town of Diredawa in Ethiopia. Discovered in the 1930s by the French adventurer and writer Henri de Montfred, and excavated by the famous French archaeologists Abbe Broil and Paul Vernert, and later on by a team led by the equally famous American archaeologists John Desmond Clark and Kenneth Williamson, the site features stratified deposits dated to around 40,000 years ago. When I started my study, it was known that numerous fragments had been recovered at Pocky Peak, but nobody knew how many, and they had never been studied before. My work has shown that the site has yielded by far the richest ochre collection ever found, consisting of more than 40 kilos of modified fragments of ochre, associated with 23 stone tools to grind and pound the ochre pieces. We found that after collecting various types of red and yellow ochre and bringing them to the site, Porca Pic inhabitants process them with different techniques, such as grinding, scraping and pounding to produce ochre powder of different coarseness and shape. Chemical analysis of the residues identified on the grindstones demonstrate that these tools were used to process different types of ochre. Concentrations of ochre fragments and processing tools identify areas within the cave in which pigments were preferentially processed. Microscopic analysis show that some ochre pieces were curated and ground at different times to produce small quantities of ochre powder, probably for body painting. The earliest known personal ornament dating back to 80,000 years ago in Southern Africa and to 100,000 years ago in North Africa in the Near East are covered with red ochre. This suggests that ochre was already used for symbolic purposes at that time and probably earlier. For which purposes ochre was used 300,000 years ago, however, remains an open question. The use of high-quality ochre from distant sources, the selection of certain use, and the transformation by eating of goethite, present in yellow ochre, into hematite, which creates red ochre, are the reason evoked very often to support a symbolic use of ochre in ancient times, but not everybody agrees with that. Traditional societies use ochre for both symbolic and utilitarian purposes, such as tanning hides, prevent insect bite and protect the skin from the sun. It has been proposed that the most ancient pigment may have been used for functional rather than for symbolic purposes. The presence of ochre on beads demonstrate that ochre was used symbolically in Africa at least 100,000 years ago. This debate has stimulated an interest for traditional societies who still use ochre in their everyday life. 
a well-known ethnic group who makes an intensive use of ochre, are the Ovahimba, a Bantu pastoralist society from the north of Namibia. Ovahimba women cover themselves with a mixture of finely ground ochre powder and purified cow butter. Large amounts of ochre are incorporated in their hairstyles. The braids they create are often lengthened by adding bits of woven hay, goat hair, and artificial hair extensions. In East Africa, ethnic groups of the southern Omo Valley also use pigments for body decoration and have a traditional knowledge of ochre processing and application. Perhaps the best known among these groups is the hammer. The Hammer is a pastoralist ethnic group who speak an omotic language called Hammer or Hammer Bana. Approximately 46,000 Hammer live in the area comprised between the Ethiopian highlands and northern Kenya. Cattle, mainly goats and cows, are the mainstay of their economy, which is also based on the production of honey, sorghum and moringa. Although fully connected to the outside world, the hammer are attached to their traditional culture, rituals and attires. The hammer use ochre for multiple functions, including hygienic purposes, but color plays an important role in their rituals. Ethnographers Jane Liddell and Ivo Strecker have shown that ochre is used in numerous ceremonies, and that red, for example, is often associated with blood. Pigment is an inherent component of hammer culture. Red ochre and less frequently white or yellow clay are used for multiple purposes. Hammer women produce a mixture of ochre powder, butter, fragrant herbs and acacia gum that they regularly apply to their hair. When the mixture dries out, they remove it and reapply a freshly mixed compound. Some men also apply ochre and clay to their hair. Children's bodies and hair are also sometimes covered with ochre. Ochre also plays a key role in ceremonies. For example, using it as a body paint or to color ritual objects. Women who are about to be married shave their head and cover their body in ochre for several weeks. An expedition to the Hammer country is organized with the aim of documenting how ochre is acquired, processed and used to make the traditional Hammer women's hairstyle. The researchers intend to document these vanishing practices and acquire knowledge that may help them to interpret ochre use in Paleolithic times. Two hammer women from Dombo, a village located near the little town of Turmi, agree to show how they produce ochre powder and apply it to their hair. The women leave the village and walk for two kilometers to reach a calcareous outcrop close to the nearby Wadi Keska. They examine the outcrop, looking for veins rich in iron oxide, recognizable by their light red and purple color. When easily accessible, fragments of the sort rocks are chopped off with heavy stones. Difficult to access veins are exploited by hammering a drill bit or a pickaxe head with a stone. Recovered rock fragments are carefully examined and those considered of good quality kept in a container made out of a calabash.
The second phase consists in heating the rock fragments to modify their color. The rocks are transported to the bush next to the outcrop. A fireplace in which the rocks are placed is built with branches. Branches with leaves are used to make the fire grow and avoid smoke, which would blacken the fragments and the final product. The rocks are left in the hearth all night. After one night in the hearth, the rocks have acquired a bright red color and are ready for processing. The heated rock fragments are fractured crushed and ground between a large slab and a heavy pebble until a fine red powder is produced. Back at the village, the two women prepare the binder that will be mixed with the ochre. Acacia gum is carefully pounded. Afterwards, it is mixed with butter and coffee. The compound is gently blended until it becomes an almost liquid substance. Then it is kept in a calabash recipient inside a hut. The final step is the application to the hair. Goat skins are placed on the ground, where all the required materials, gum compound, butter, and different types of ochre powder are laid. One ochre type, lighter in color, is mixed with herbal fragrances. The other, which according to the two women was heated longer, is preferred by them because of its brighter red color. The rejuvenation of the hairstyle starts by removing the old mixture that is now dry and has lost its shiny aspect. Then butter is added to the gum compound. Once it reaches the desired consistency, it is applied to the hair. The ochre powder is then sprinkled on top of the hair where the mixture of acacia gum was applied and spread out while twisting hair into ringlets. The result is a shiny and intense red-colored hair. The shoulders and attire of the woman are also covered in ochre after the application on the hair. Samples of ochre are collected by the researchers to analyze them and compare with the archaeological material. We conducted different chemical analysis to characterize the rocks used by the Hamar women. Scanning electron microscopy coupled with EDS microanalysis identifies the elemental composition of the ochre pieces and allow us to document the morphology of the rock at a microscopic scale. The heating of ochre is particularly interesting to us as there are cases of thermal transformation of ochre during the Paleolithic. We analyzed the ochre heated by the Hamar women with a transmission electron microscope to create a frame of reference that will allow us to establish when ochre was heated in prehistory to change color. The Hamar are one of the last human groups which still use ochre as a cultural tradition transmitted through time across generations. Cultural practices involving the use of pigments started at least 300,000 years ago. Although the functions of these practices certainly changed through time, ethnographic studies show that there is a clear link between cognitive complexity and the use of ochre, and that although difficult to demonstrate in an archaeological context, most symbolic systems make use of color. Although we must be careful 
when comparing traditional societies with past human groups, ethnoarchaeology opens a privileged window onto the link between material culture and human behavior, and is therefore essential to our understanding of human societies and their evolution.